going with you? How are you enjoying this isolation, uh, this quiet time, this slow time? There are some people I think are actually finding it a little bit challenging and other people it's a dream come true. And I must admit myself from being slowed down from my challenges over Christmas, it's as if the whole world has come down to the pace that I'm at. Very selfish, I know, especially with all some of the loved ones that are passing away. Uh, but uh, I wish you all well. I, I wish you all peace and I wish you all wonderful opportunity to do the passions that you've been meaning to do but have been putting on one side. Now, as you've seen from the titles, uh, I'm holding on to this to see if there are comments. Uh, from the titles you see, I've sometimes put discovering the she, she, discovering the she, or bathing with the she. And the she itself, as a word, seems to be one that hasn't been tampered much. Uh, a lot of the Irish and Gaelic and Scottish folklore has kind of got tampered a lot since the printing industry became very popular through the 19th century and uprose the Celtic romanticism uh, because there weren't investigative uh, reporters back then so the printers needed something to print so the folklore became very popular and groups came around to enact the folklore but the she is something that seems to go way back um, and not being tampered with and as a word from what I've gathered it is really it just means a mound uh, if you want a sort of hard description, it's a description of a mound itself. But the important thing is what actually happens in that mound. Now, this is an Irish interpretation. I'm not going to be referring to any academia or any old journals, ancient journals. Uh, it's been many years since I've investigated those things myself. So I'm going to be speaking to you in the next half an hour, maybe a lot less. Uh, on sort of memory from storytellers and from personal experiences. But I'm going to move on to something that you might be able to look into. Now, going back to the idea of the she being ill, a lot of people are very familiar with the story of the Tour de Dan and the fairy race or half fairy race that were driven underground into the underworld, into these what they call the fairy hills. Uh, by the Malaysians and then after they'd done that the Malaysians were starving nothing was growing there was no abundance so they made a deal up with the spirit of the Tour de Danon under the ground uh, to be in partnership so they would nourish from the underground the water the roots and there would be abundance and it's from that that the stories of the people of the Shi have come about uh, so you've got the Eshti and uh, the people of the Shi. And uh, they're the ones in Ireland that are, are working away uh, underground because the Tua de Dan and themselves came as farming folk. Uh, they grew their grains. Excuse me, I'm getting dry from this fire. As if we need a fire in a way. And they, they were very much the farming people and, and they started the farm, farming on the hills and it took a while before they actually chopped down the trees and the forests uh, and to increase the farming so the focus was very much on growing the crops for themselves now in scotland the she has a very different meaning they're not people of the hills they're people of the forest of the woods uh, and this came in with the gale so you there you got a whole different idea of the the Fey people of the She people being the spirits that protected the woods. And you may be familiar with the Banshee. Uh, the Banshee being the person of the hill that would actually come to a family at the time when someone is passing. And it is said they'll only come to any family that have been descended from the Malaysians. Uh, so in theory, I suppose if you follow with that, if you're not, uh, Descended from the Malaysian hard luck. You're not going off to Tirnano, but I don't believe that one. I think we've got all equality on that one. But in Scotland, in the woods there, you've got the Barshi, but a bit of a different pronunciation. 
and they are protector of the wildlife in the woods. So, uh, and they were women, said to be women, that would lure the hunters that were in the wood looking for food. And if they thought the hunters were greedy, they would lure them into a passion. And, uh, and then as they're in that passion, they actually became like fairy vampires. <laughs> and they would drain their bloods, and that was one less hunter to go for an animal in the woods. So they were very much the spirit of the woods. And I suppose a lot more macabre than the, the stories that are told of the she in the hills over here. Another story that's uh, probably very familiar to people uh, are the she, or she that ride the horses that take those who've passed away, passed from the banshee, they take them on the horses and they go off west, off to Tirnanol, to the land of youth, land of eternity. And uh, I assume many of you are familiar with the um, oyster catchers that run along the side of the shores. Uh, I seem to see more in Scotland now than certainly in Ireland, but one of the loveliest stories I know of that is of the oyster catchers are uh, actually stopping the spirits from the, uh, that have gone out to the turn and all they might have jumped off their she horses from actually swimming back in and trying to resume their lives on earth. So the oyster catchers, it said, when they go up and down on the shorelines are actually chasing the spirits away to go back out and see, get yourself back to Tyrann and all. Though there is, um, in parts of Scotland, there's a reverse of that, saying the oyster catchers are there to actually greet the new life coming from Tin and Og that's going to be uh, reborn again. So there's lovely stories on this, and it's worth following that. But uh, what I want to really move on to is, what would the she be to you? Now, I would say that the word she, it kind of relates to a mound. And then a lot of you might be familiar with the kayak, kayak, uh, who, when you translate back, they're the builder of the mounds. So they, it's as if they built the mounds and the she are the ones that are very active inside them. Um, so, so when you think of kayak, people, a lot of people these days think of the goddess. And uh, they think of the goddess because of the birth and the femininity of the creation uh, of life uh, but of course you have God as well so God and Goddess being singular but the she are all these different components as if they have different characteristics even in the stories and I'm going to go on to this in fairy stories I think it's in May of how you you get the she or the fairies they either go around in a, a sort of a cluster uh, to demonstrate uh, their presence, or they're individual and they're mischievous, and then uh, they're the ones that are supposed to live in the home. I as a child, uh, I remember I would be surprised sometimes if I moved into what was a very untidy room, living room, or the kitchen, and I go in there and suddenly it's all clean and wonderful, and I thought, well, since I was last in, nobody's been in here, I'm sure. So when I used to ask, uh, oh, you know, what's happened in here? I was always told, oh, the fairies, the, the house fairy came and visited and did the job. So there's a, a bunch of stories around that, but that's a bit of a crossover to what I'm going to be talking about in May. Uh, one, the main reason I'm talking about the, uh, bring the she up in, and it's a shame we're not outside in the tree labyrinth because it's a bit easier to explain it there. But a lot of people who visit the uh, tree labyrinth and been introduced and I, I introduce them a bit with a bit of a story and a meditation so that they can actually trust their senses they don't have to go in with their linear language they don't have to go in there because someone's told them to go in there it's a place where people can be away from being told what to do and it can be their own consciousness that appears and if we relate that say to the she hill it's like being nourished from our consciousness uh, inside our own hill and uh, that's what feeds us, gives uh, the courage and that's what allows us to be the harvest and blossom and do what we do. How do we encourage that? How do we encourage us to be in that state rather than being uh, of an instruction of a, a religious order that tells us, well this is how you use the labyrinth, make sure you do this, you can do this but you can't do that. 
the usual sort of um, you know, set of instructions and rules. I'm trying to think of what the actual word is. There's some sort of polite word for that, but it's uh, escaped me at the moment. But you know, you're under your own consciousness and the morality of that and what that's guiding. And that means you don't need your language because your sight, your touch, your smell, your feeling, the whole works of your senses. That's your language at that time. Now, when you're walking around uh, in the tree labyrinth, and you probably find this, it's not just exclusive to the tree labyrinth. I'm sure when you're in places out in the wild and people come up with stories of that, you're, you're so engrossed in something, you're into a kind of mindfulness, you're into a contemplation, and you just totally absorb, your senses have made that connection. And then out of the corner of your eye, either eye, either side, you see stuff that seems to be dashing around. Sometimes it seems to dash in front of you, or leaps up in front of you. And uh, you think, oh, I've seen a fairy, I've seen the she, I, I've uh, seen some kind of entity. And you can describe it. Suddenly, that movement of light and that dance comes into an image that you can relate to, and you could even draw it out. And to a lot of people, they're convinced then that they've seen a fairy, they've seen the she, and that's what it is. And that, to them, is the proof that they exist. I'm not going to knock that proof, because if you uh, take a sense and put it into an image, then that's a language that we can understand, because... I think uh, when we're talking about the she, the fae, all of this, we're talking about trying to make sense of that great mystery. That great mystery that has nothing to do with time. It doesn't have anything to do with space. These are sort of conveniences that us humans are put together for calibration so that we can create things, create a language even, so we can go linear on a few things. So if we haven't got language to something, and we want to talk to someone about it, then we draw an image, or we write a sentence. And to me, that is the she, that is the fair. Yes, you have seen it, it is real, because it was there. But I think if you want to be scientific and practical about it, I think what's lovely about this, and especially on a day like today where there's a lot of wind, sun is out, then a little shower. If you were stood in the tree labyrinth or any wood, there'd be a real sort of dancing of sunbeams, they're jumping around and you, as you're absorbed in the hole that is there you know all those little sunbeams that are jumping around you can imagine as being actually little people big people and it's as if they're there to welcome you to dance with you to actually be surrounding you and that obviously that's quite a detachment from the whole folklore of the she being the underground roots the underground energy that's there to actually ensure that life flows and that's to me what what the she is it's a generation of that life energy it's what moves the life energy if you've got a god you've got a goddess to me that's something that's very static very whole very complete but very static it's not moving how does that stuff move around how would you get the ebb and flow of the weather of the seasons of the dis different lengths of day and night, all these different variations that we can't explain. But if we actually have a group of uh, beings, entities that are doing this, suddenly it all makes sense. And we can play with that. And not only do we play with that, there's this sort of fuzzy feeling, uh, a lovely feeling inside ourselves, that this is what life is all about. This is what we're here for, to have fun with this, to be inspired by this. And it's as if these things actually bring up our sense of love, our sense of connection, our sense of acceptance, and uh, our sense of tolerance. And in this time of downtime, uh, that, uh, where there's a challenge, a lot of people are finding themselves in a division where they've got this time and stuff they put on the long finger, stuff that they've been procrastinating, that now they can actually get into it. They can perhaps write that book, do the drawing, improve the garden they got, make the fence, learn a new skill, and this is this is priceless. Uh, it's a sh it is obviously desperate. These people that are getting ill and dying, but whilst we're protecting ourselves, I don't think it's selfish to indulge in bringing our spirit forward and actually allowing trust in that 
and doing what we're doing. But of course, on the other side of the fence are these conspiracy theories that uh, they may be right or wrong, but all they're doing to us is churning up more fear and taking us away from this whole passion of our being and this opportunity. So I'm being kind of a bit preachy with that, but I'm sort of asking by to consider that and to actually, how about thinking of that as a, a meditation, as a visualization? I think that's uh, really the main point of the Sunday session, is just that concept of allowing your images to actually mean something. Now, I'll have a quick look, see what the hello to the Sunday session, that's me. And Donna's uh, watching, uh, Ethna Lynch, hello. Paul Egan is watching us, and I imagine a few people will be watching further along the line when this is archived. And get yourself out as much as you can amongst the trees, the plants, doing your garden. Get, you know, we're supposed to be washing our hands all the time, but don't let that stop you getting your hands in the soil. Uh, of course there's bacteria there, but I think we need that, uh, perhaps to protect us. That bacteria there, if we get it on our hands, that's probably going to defend us from quite a few things. But get indulged in whatever way you can connect with the life that's out there, whether it's wild, whether it's rewilding, whether you're actually cultivating. Just get yourself and really enjoy that love and uh, connection uh, now that you've got the opportunity to. And when you find through that, doing that, you've got all these visuals of different things happening and you can't explain them, the dancing uh, sunbeams, the shadows, the leaves turning, there's not many at the moment, but anything is turning. If you get an image of something, hold on to that, let that guide you, even make a drawing of it. And this is what really makes our life lovely. And it's like being a child again. Children love these images from the fairy stories, from these animals that put human clothes on and stand up. You know, all these, what we might regard as ridiculous things, I think they're essential. And I think if we can, I'm altering the folklore in a way, but I think if we can feel the she as being one way of explaining this unexplainable mystery uh, in its, not so much fragments, but in its dancing movements, that we get a sense of what is really happening inside the she, she hills, what is happening perhaps in the forests of Scotland. And one imagery uh, that has always stuck with me, and I think people who don't live in the USA, if you go over there, and they're in other countries, but I was really st struck one night, I couldn't sleep, and uh, it was nice, and I actually went for a walk in the woods by where I was in, in Florida. And I don't think there was a moon that night. There certainly wasn't any light pollution. And suddenly there were all these dancing lights. I thought, oh, goodness me, I found the fairies. And it took me a few moments to realize uh, that, uh, oh, I forget the words, uh, what they are, but they, the, uh, what are they called the flies? You'll know the name. Anyway, they, um, and they were buzzing around. The nearest I've seen of that is what we got around here. But they're solitary and they, they don't move around much as the glow worms. But uh, unfortunately, they're becoming extinct, I gather. I haven't seen one for years, but as a child, I used to see them. What I would like to do, I was talking about um, Bon, Bon, she in Scotland, uh, the she that are out in the woods and the lure men with passion. Over here, uh, yeah, that's a type of fairy lover, uh, as they talk over there, she lover. We have that uh, in Ireland as well, but it's actually men, the law women, and we're come, sort of coming up into the season, I'll be talking more about this in May, but as I usually add a poem, and surprisingly during this downtime, I haven't been writing poems, been either doing the gardening or doing event stuff, uh, so I've got this one, it's the fairy lover. The Gunconnock, Gunconnock, the fey lover, maybe the modern green man, the arriver at night in darkness, with flickered lights of temptation, an invitation to debauchery. It drives women into passionate frenzy, and the winds carry me like the wild charging stallions. 
riding through the breath of lavender's blending scent to rest upon the posts of your abode. Watching you dream your dreams in bed, awakening carnal desires within, hot flames from flowing blood hearth in winter, every fearless touch undoing into abandonment, reveling in fearless present within the forbidden. And then the woman discovers that it's actually her own spirit that is driving the passion. It's not a, some external dream fairy lover. And it's those few lines I think sum up what I'm suggesting and inviting you to explore. That the fearless, in employing that fearless touch that undoes into abandonment, into complete trust of that inspiration, of that underworld, of that hidden underworld, as if your body is that she mound, and reveling in that fearless presence within what other people may tell us is forbidden. And then we discover that the spirit that's driving us, the she that seems to be driving us, is actually not the external dream, it's actually our inner dream that's dancing with what we picture, imagine and tell others about as being the she. And I'll finish it there. Uh, and I hope uh, you enjoyed that bit of waffle <laughs> on today's Sunday session, Discovering the She. And I hope you'll be able to, and I trust you'll be able to, enjoy these days rather than be fearful of them, rather than unfortunately be sorrowful. Some of us, perhaps many of us, know people who are, are going down sick and some people that are actually passed away or are passing away. Unfortunately, that's perhaps going to be past of our life. But let that not be all of your life. Allow that to be a reminder of the preciousness of your own life. You can still be of service to those that are past or are passing, but don't allow your entire being to be of slavery servitude. Allow yourself, I think, to run that passion through and connect with all that's going on and enjoy your time while you can in this indulgence until we're called upon to get back to as things perhaps were when suddenly our rulers, our dictators, our people telling us what to do kind of take over a bit. So have a, a wonderful isolation time and enjoy and do message me uh, on this. Uh, thank you for being and I'll be with you next Sunday. Bye, thanks so much.